Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is The Vulgar Marxist. You are probably wondering why I did an extremely boring and prosaic video on National Socialism and how to debunk it. First of all, for the reason I gave, that it is obvious that National Socialism is perfectly debunkable, and the people saying, we cannot argue with Nazis, are frankly full of shit. But there was an ulterior motive, and that is the preamble to this video. Before I could reasonably do a video discussing the concept of white supremacy, or rather white privilege, as a mainstay of American society, rather than some obscure theory propagated by fringe lunatics, I needed to first attack the fringe lunatics in order to ensure that anyone attempting to go, you're just the racist, had no legs to stand on. That said, I am deeply sorry for making so boring and prosaic a video. It should have been a better work. I simply didn't have the time because I was driving. And I'm going to be driving a lot, so I'm afraid the level of... Uh, vitriol in my content is going to be significantly lower. I end a 12-hour day utterly exhausted. If I'm able to make a video at all, I'm probably quite tired. But that said, it is my weekend, so we are going to get working on the project of debunking white privilege, or at the very least, the list of privileges cited by Peggy McIntosh. Now, there have been several articles recently attacking this, which is why I am now comfortable saying, yeah, we can do this thing. Most regrettably attacked Miss McIntosh herself, her status as an Ivy League professor, her financial situation, her upbringing, all of that. That's not what we're gonna do here. What we are going to do is a series of logical inquiries into each and every stipulation Miss McIntosh makes. Miss McIntosh has a list of, I think, 26 privileges. And we are going to discuss whether or not the things listed are, in fact, privileges. But first, we are going to discuss what precisely a privilege is. Now, I am including here both the definition of privilege and the definition of special because we are going to have to use both of these definitions to get to the bottom of what is being said. A privilege is defined as a special right, advantage, or immunity granted to a few select persons or one person in particular. Special is defined as something above or beyond what is usual or normal. Now, let us discuss this. A, a privilege is therefore defined as a right, advantage, or immunity above and beyond what is usual or normal. Now, we know from social compact theory that rights are and must be universal. That is, rights originating in the state of nature, freely available to all people who wish to avail themselves of them, cannot be created by government, cannot be created by society, religion, economics, or any other institution. They supersede and pre-exist all of these things. For something to be a right, it must be observable in a condition of a state of nature. So, you cannot have special rights. This does not make any sense. It is a contradiction of the term. A right, necessarily being universal, must be granted to everyone or it is no longer a legitimate right. 
Thus, we have arrived at our first contradiction. We haven't even gone past the most banal dictionary definition of privilege, and already we have a contradiction. A right cannot be a privilege. You may be denied a right. You may have your rights violated. But that does not mean someone else has a privilege. If a thing is a right, it cannot be a privilege. We also have here a second point. A privilege is something beyond the expectation of normal. Walking up the street cannot be a privilege. It is perfectly normal to walk up the street. Sitting in your living room cannot be a privilege. It is perfectly normal to sit in your living room. These are standard things everyone reasonably expects to do. Now, before we proceed, I am not going to judge this second point based on the standard, is it reasonable that most people ought to be able to do a thing? I am instead going to judge it based on the point, would it be reasonable to unilaterally deny everyone the ability to do this, or alternately, unilaterally force everyone to do this? A simple example, if not eating broccoli is a privilege, and there are several double negatives that are going to be involved in this video, which is why I'm using this example. If not eating broccoli is a privilege, is it reasonable to assert that we should force everyone to eat broccoli? That is, is it reasonable to unilaterally deny everyone the thing in question. And with a negative, that would be, is it reasonable to force everyone to undergo whatever is being discussed? Now, there is a third condition we need for this discussion before we proceed. The last criteria we shall use has been supplied quite fortuitously by Miss McIntosh herself. If something is a privilege, it must be unearned. Therefore, if it is earned, it cannot be a privilege. Now, as I hope we all remember from my video on titleage, all titleages are earned. That is, the obligation imposed by society justifies the compensation received by those who are expected to perform the obligation. If I am required not to assault other persons, then I am entitled not to be assaulted by other persons. If I am required to perform a task, then I am entitled to the tools, materials, and resources necessary to do it. Society cannot impose obligations, positive obligations, onto individuals without compensating them the resources necessary to fulfill those obligations. Thus, again, I repeat, if, as Ms. McIntosh said, all privileges are unearned, therefore anything which is received as compensation for a social obligation and therefore has been earned cannot be a privilege. And it is with these three lines of inquiry that we shall proceed. First, is the thing in question a privilege? Is it something which may freely be taken from everyone without complaint? Second, if it may not be freely taken from everyone without complaint, is it a right? Is it a thing observable in a condition of a state of nature, independent and autonomous from all government authority? If it is not observable in a state of nature, is it a titleage? Is it a thing, is it justified by the existence of some a priori positive obligation imposed by a society? Now, we are going to ask these three questions independent of each other. I'm not going to assume that simply because something is not a privilege or a right, that necessarily means it is a titleage. There may be a fourth category as yet unidentified, 
and we must, while we are doing, explore the idea that the three categories we have already, right, privilege, titleage, are not adequate to all situations in all times and at all places. There may be more categories as yet unidentified, and we must ensure to leave room for the possibility that a fourth category may yet be discovered. But I digress. <clears throat> I am going to be going through the list in groups. I'm not doing it in one video. We're at 10 minutes already. If I try to do all 50 of them in one go, this would be a three hour video. So I'm going to do the first 13 tonight, then proceed, I think, with the next 13, the 13 after that, and then however many remain. I think that would be 39, the 11 remaining after that. So, without further ado, let us begin with the first 13 on the white privilege checklist. Aren't we glad I left room for that? Very first question, and I just realized I completely forgot a category. Do the majority or even all white people enjoy this thing? If someone says, all cats are black, and I go, excuse me, I know a cat and it seems to be orange, then I have disproven the claim that all cats are black, have I not? So, number one, I can arrange to be in the company of people of my own race most of the time. No, I can't. I'm a truck driver. I stop at whatever truck stop I'm at when I run out of hours or I'm close to it. And very frequently, they may contain people of my race. They may not contain people of my race. I'm really not in a position to be picky about that and frankly have no reason to do so. Whoever happens to be in the truck stop is who happens to be there. If they're white, cool. If they're black, cool. If they're Hispanic, cool. If they're Asian, cool. We're all truckers. It doesn't matter. But again, back to our criteria. criteria. First, would it be reasonable to unilaterally deny to everyone the ability to be in the company of people exclusively of their own race? Now, we're not saying should people not care? That's a different question. We are saying should we forcibly move people so that they are forced, regardless of whether they want to or not, to include members of all ethnicities in any group they are a part of. I would imagine the Black Panther Party would have a severe issue with this, as would, for instance, the Jewish Anti-Defamation League. There are a number of groups based upon ethnicity, nationality, and other categories of race who are quite content to only be with members of their own group. Now, I can imagine arguments on the other side of this, so I'm not going to say one way or the other in this particular category. It is possible some might very well argue that the Jewish Anti-Defamation League ought to include Asian Americans, that the Black Panther Party ought to include Hispanics. I make no judgment in either, in either way. Next. Do you have a right to be in a group consisting only of members of your own race? We can observe it in the state of nature. Of course, we can observe people eating each other in a state of nature. So obviously not everything which occurs in the state of nature is a right. We do surrender certain rights when we agree to organize a civil society. Is this a right we have surrendered? Possibly. Again, there are a number of groups who would very much like to only be with members of their own ethnicity. So I cannot say whether or not this one is a right. Is it a titleage? Potentially. 
if I have a social obligation to recognize as legitimate the idea of race, then I am entitled to organize around that idea however I see fit. This is one of the reasons why liberals and early leftists campaigned to abolish the concept of race rather than doubling down as social justice has done. This is why we speak of colorblindness, because again, if race exists as a recognized concept in society, and people who would very much like to not recognize that concept are forced to, then they are entitled to organize around that concept. The simpler solution would be to simply not require anyone to recognize it and indeed request people please not recognize it. So, presuming that social justice advocates believe race ought to be something people should be forced to recognize, then yes, organizing with members of your preferred group is an entitlement because you are the ones who made it an obligation to recognize its existence. So our first item is maybe a privilege, depends what the Anti-Defamation League say. Maybe you're right, probably not though. And quite possibly a title is depending on how you believe society should be organized. Second item. If I should choose to move, I can arrange to live in an area I can afford and would choose to live. Now, this is ostensibly two things, but I'm pretty sure we can condense them down. Should everyone be unilaterally denied the ability to live in an area they can afford or would choose to? This is a relatively simple question. Would the residents of Portlandia be upset if they had to move to East St. Louis? or Detroit, or Flint, Michigan? The answer is almost certainly yes. So it cannot be a privilege. Do individuals in a state of nature have the right to make their dwelling where they choose? Yes. The groundhog living in my parents' garden would very happily assert it has the right to live there. The wasps nesting on my porch seem to believe they have every right to nest there. The sparrows in the eaves of my apartment building likewise seem to believe they have every right to make their nest wherever they choose. So we can very clearly observe a natural light right, existing at least in the state of nature, to live wherever the individual may deem fit or appropriate. Now, the institution of property has nominally revoked this right, and I will not contest it has not. That is one of the central points of Proudhoon is that individuals in modern society or even antiquated society could not freely choose to live wherever they wished. As all property, that is all land, had been claimed by one owner or another, and those without property had no meaningful way of acquiring it. But the fact that individuals are being denied a right does not mean those who enjoy the right have a privilege. Again, I repeat, the denial to some of a right does not denote the privilege of others. So, we have established that living where you wish is a right. Is it a title age? Doubtful. I'm not seeing any social obligation. Well, there is theoretically an obligation since the right has been revoked in favor of property. Then those who control property having imposed a positive obligation not to interfere with their property 
have likewise imposed a title edge that those who cannot acquire property have are entitled to a living affordable living abode in some form. It may not be the one they like, but the fact that I have a positive ob obligation not to occupy any vacant house I happen to see means I am entitled in return for recognizing this positive obligation to an abode in some form so I am not left destitute and homeless. This is not a titleage most people would like to recognize, certainly not conservatives and liberals would likewise probably bark quite loudly in objection, but we cannot deny a positive obligation has been imposed. I am not free to do something I would quite easily be able to do if government did not exist. So we have both an observable right, which is being denied to some, and potentially a titleage. But again, what we do not have is a privilege. Number three, I can be reasonably certain my neighbors in such a location will be neutral or pleasant to me. I would like to begin again by saying this is not universal. I have had a number of neighbors who have been staggeringly rude, unbelievably rude. I had one fellow in college who thought it entirely appropriate to throw keggers every weekend. And when the police finally knocked on the door because he was waking up everyone around him in a one block radius, and yes, I let the police in because I was frankly sick and tired of finding drunken teenagers on the front lawn the next morning with their clothes in staggering disarray and was deeply concerned that there were roofies being passed out at that part at his parties. He saw fit to get quite vocally angry at me for the hubris of thinking maybe he shouldn't be handing 18 and 19 year old women spiked drinks. So no, this is not something necessarily enjoyed by all white people. But that said, should no one anywhere be welcomed by their neighbors in a neutral or pleasant manner? What a ridiculous contention. I'm not even gonna dignify that with an answer. Do you have a right to be welcomed by your neighbors in a neutral and pleasant manner? This is not observable. A flock of sparrows will very happily chase off another flock of sparrows, as will pigeons, crows, or any other avian bird, infringing on the territory they have deemed their hunting or whatever other grounds they see fit to claim. So no, we cannot observe a right to civility in a condition of a violent war of all against all, or even any other construction of a state of nature. Do I have a titleage that individuals ought to be pleasant to me? Yes. Being pleasant to your neighbors is quite arduous. My neighbors at the apartment have seen fit to break one of our washing machines and leave the other one full of sodden clothing that they haven't even bothered to start because apparently they think they should do a soak in the one only functional washing machine. And trial trails of my evening, folks. <laughs> but yes, being pleasant to your neighbors is a positive obligation. Now, your return for this is your neighbors are pleasant to you. So, my obligation to be pleasant towards others bears a reciprocal obligation that they be pleasant towards me in return. Now, one may contest that the African-American community is not receiving reciprocal civility. That is entirely true. That is quite possible and quite true. But again, the denial of a titleage or a right does not denote a privilege on the part of others. If no one is being civil to me, that does not mean that those who are being uncivil have received privilege. It means 
I am being denied a titleage, I have worked to earn. I have been civil to them. I am entitled to civility in return. The denial of a titleage does not denote a privilege, just as the denial of a right does not denote a privilege. Well, it is becoming incredibly obvious this video is going to be significantly longer than I thought it would, but we shall continue. Fourth part. I can go shopping without being followed or harassed. Now, there are a very large number of European American women who regularly complain that when going out in public, they are followed and harassed. I will direct your attention to the 30 minutes of walking video, no, eight hours of walking. The eight hours of walking was an exercise in a young woman who ostensibly looked to be going out to be shopping and was apparently followed and harassed, according to her. So again, this is not something necessarily enjoyed by all European Americans. However, should we unilaterally deny to everyone the ability to go out without being followed or harassed? No, that's again a completely absurd premise. I cannot imagine anyone asserting that every single person ought to be followed and harassed. So this, again, cannot be a privilege. It is not unnecessary, unreasonable, or beyond the expectation of normal that you not be followed and harassed when going out. Is there right? No. Lions very frequently follow and harass zebras. Wolves follow and harass caribou. Coyotes follow and harass rabbits. It is perfectly observable in a state of nature that animals are followed and harassed. Is it a titleage? That gets difficult. Not following and harassing someone really isn't a positive obligation, it's a negative obligation. I'm not having to actively do something, I'm having to refrain from doing something. So again, titleages apply only to positive obligations. They apply only in situations where I actually have to actively do a thing and society has told me you are required to actively do this thing. And not following and harassing someone intentionally, I mean, certainly if we happen to be going to the same store and we walked in the same entrance to the mall, I'm gonna be following them for a bit. I may walk a bit faster, so I end up ahead of them. I may cross to the other side of the mall through fair, so I'm not directly following them, and then accelerate so I'm past them. But again, this really isn't a positive obligation. So no, we cannot say there is a titleage not to be followed and harassed. We can say no one would want to. So again, that leaves us with the question, is there another category of things here because we've just discovered it's not a privilege it's not a right it's not a titleage but most people would reasonably expect not to be followed and harassed so i have spent the better part of two weeks thinking on this and for those wondering why the sound changed, I'm sitting in a truck stop right now waiting for my truck to get repaired. The conclusion I have reached is we need to split titleage into two categories, positive and negative titleage. Positive titleage is what I described before. That is 
society has imposed a positive obligation onto the individual and must award the individual emoluments proportional to the obligation imposed. Negative titleage is a reciprocal obligation between individuals. That is, two or more people agree among themselves not to do a thing contingent that no one else in the group do the thing either. So in this case, I agree not to follow people around if they agree not to follow me around. This then is also part of titleage. Originally, I did not want to make negative obligations part of titleage to avoid the issue of blackmail or extortion. That is, I'm not going to punch you in the face if you pay me $10 not to punch you in the face. No, that's not titleage, that's extortion. However, if we limit negative obligations purely to reciprocal exchange, that is, I'm not going to punch you in the face if you don't punch me in the face, then there is no possibility of extortion and we may safely include negative obligations into titleage as a separate category from positive obligations. I'm only going to do the next four or five, I think. These really aren't going to be particularly hard. They're just general complaints that really don't have much of a basis in anything. So, number five. I can open the newspaper or turn on the television to see people of my race widely represented. People of all races are widely represented. Anime is huge. There are entire channels dedicated to African Americans. I'm not seeing how this is a relevant complaint. I mean, even back during the 1990s, 1980s, you could see people of African American heritage represented very widely on television, if not in the newspaper. But again, our three criteria. One, should no one anywhere be permitted to turn on the television and see people of their race widely represented? I'm not certain how that would be possible, unless all television programs are cartoons. This isn't a privilege. This doesn't meet the basic criteria of a privilege. Is it completely beyond reasonable to expect to turn on the television and see people of your ethnicity widely represented? People of all ethnicities in principle should be widely represented on television. That doesn't denote a privilege to one group of people. Second, is it a right? Not seeing how it is. Television and newspapers don't exist in a condition of a state of nature. Is it a titleage? That is, do I have a positive obligation to... Well, no, I don't have a positive obligation there. Is there a negative obligation there? There might be a positive or negative obligation on the part of the newspapers at the television stations, but I'm not really seeing how you would go about facilitating that. So I'm going to go with no. It's not a privilege. It's not a right. It's not a titleage. It's not anything. It's just a random complaint. I mean, you might argue there should be a titleage that television stations are required to give equal airtime to all ethnicities, but then you're going to have to pay them for that. Do you want to tax each ethnicity so they get equal airtime on television, proportional to their population? I'm not certain that's going to work too well. People aren't, I don't think people are going to like that very much, but... In theory, it could be done, I suppose. So it is possible that a titleage is being asserted here. I don't see how white people have a titleage at present to this, but if you wish to assert such a thing, you are welcome and free to do so.
Number six, when I am told about our national heritage or civilization, I am told it is people of my ethnicity who made it what it is. That's true everywhere. If you go to Saudi Arabia, they will tell you that Arabs made civilization what it is. If you go to China, you'll be told that the Chinese made civilization what it is. If there was a race of space aliens on Mars, they would tell you that space aliens on Mars made Mars what it is. Okay. Furthermore, this is a simple mathematical fact. If the majority of people in a, in a given area are of one ethnicity, then anything which happens in that area is going to be primarily the responsibility of the majority of the people in that area who labored to make it what it was. But again, our three criteria. Should no one anywhere be told that their ethnicity is responsible for the achievements of society? Possible, though that would technically be historically inaccurate. Again, if you have the majority of people in an area of one ethnicity, then most of the achievements that occur in that area are going to be the responsibility of the people of the ethnicity who are the majority. So is not deliberately lying to people a privilege? No. No, it's not. It is entirely reasonable to expect historical accuracy from the textbooks and professors recording the events of society. And again, I repeat for the third time, if the majority of people in an area are of one ethnicity, then they are primarily going to be responsible for the events that happened, and the historical documents will reflect that. So expecting the historical documents to accurately reflect what has occurred in the region in question is not beyond what is normal and expected in society, okay? Do you have a right? I'm not seeing what right could possibly be here. I, I, I'm not seeing how there could be a right in either direction here. Either a right to have the majority of historical documents state that your ethnicity is responsible or the right not to have the majority of historical documents state that. Uh, first off, there aren't historical documents in the state of nature, so no, I'm not seeing how there could possibly be a right there. Is there a right to have the narratives of a society primarily be about the majority of the people in that society? Possibly. Certainly we can observe verbal histories in a state of nature. Most societies have those, and most societies tend to have their oral history be about the majority of people in that society or the primary ethnicity in that society. So there could potentially be a right to have your oral tradition be about the primary ethnicity in the society or the majority ethnicity in the society. Potentially. Not really seeing it, but you can make an argument. Is there a titleage, positive or negative? I would say there is a negative titleage. There is a negative titleage not to lie about what is happening or has happened. That is, if I am responsible to be forward and honest with you, you are responsible to be forward and honest with me in return about the events that have transpired and what has caused those events. We know those who ignore history are doomed to repeat its mistakes. If we are deliberately falsifying history, 
in order to create the impression that the majority of people in the region are not responsible for most of what has gone on, then we are going to be at very great risk of repeating staggering errors in judgment simply because they are not recorded for us to learn from. So yes, I would say there is a title edge. To be honest with the history as it has occurred, and that in doing so, you are going to unquestionably hit the issue, if you could call it that, that the majority of events in a region are inevitably the result of the largest ethnicity in that region. I can be sure that my children will be given curricular materials which testify to the existence of their rights. Actually, no, I can't. Right now, anyone asserting the existence of a white race is unilaterally vilified, screamed down, and usually called every dirty name in the books. Um, I'm actually struggling to think of a time when there was not literature declaring that Africans were a race. Maybe when the Middle Ages, when there wasn't really literature on anything. I, the oldest documents in England are literally propaganda declaring that the Irish were cannibals who didn't understand how to cook food. So, no, documents testifying to the existence of race are nearly as old as written language. I'm stunned anyone would make this contention, but I suppose we could be theoretical here, okay? Um, should no documents anywhere testify to the existence of race? That's called colorblindness. The last time I checked, those on the other end of this discussion get very, very angry when you try to do that. Do you have a right to have documents testify to the existence of your race? Oral tradition again, maybe? But I'm not seeing it. Like, if you're going to complain, and, and this really runs us straight into the lot, these two things are like directly at odds with each other. If you're going to complain about an oral tradition stating that the largest ethnicity in a region is primarily responsible for the events that have occurred in that region, and then state that you have no right to have an oral tradition testifying to the existence of your ethnicity, that's really fairly hypocritical. Like, or rather you, yeah, you don't have a right. I, I don't even understand where they're going with this. Like this, is, this entire list is just not merely at odds with any outside definition of the very terms it's using, but directly at odds with itself. So I'm just going to go with, this is incoherent. I, the, the concept of a right to this is not a coherent concept, okay? Do you have a title itch, positive or negative, to documents declaring the existence of your race? Again, that would have to be reciprocal. Like, if you're going to say, yes, there is a black race, then you must also say, yes, there is a white race. And the last time I checked, that latter statement wasn't particularly popular. So, if someone wants to assert that white people are entitled to white identity, I don't think that's going to go over particularly well, but you can do that. But again, a titleage must be reciprocal. I, I genuinely think this one is best left as a write-off. It is best left as, 
Nobody gets to do this thing. I mean, that's the entire point of colorblindness is you do not get to assert the existence of a white identity contingent on nobody gets to assert the existence of a black identity. Okay. Um, so yeah, I'm just chalking this one up as totally incoherent. I don't even know why anyone would assert this unless they are attempting to declare that they have the privilege to do with it. Like, this isn't even a denial of privilege. It's an assertion of privilege. It's saying, I get to do a thing that I'm specifically saying other people don't get to do. And no, you don't get to assert that. You don't get to say, I have this ability, but nobody else gets to have it. No, we all get to have the same abilities or we all don't get to have those abilities. Number eight, if I want to, I can be fairly certain of finding a publisher for this piece on privilege. Mm, boy. Should no one be permitted to publish things on a subject of their choosing? Totally freaking ridiculous. Not even going to address that. Do you have a right to publish? That gets us into some sticky First Amendment issues. Certainly you have the right to publish on a website or blog. You have the right to text, you have the right to tweet. All of these are relatively simple free speech issues. It's hilariously enough the people advocating this who are saying you don't have a right to be published if for whatever reason they do not approve of your content. That's actually hilariously enough one of the reasons this movement worries me so because let's just take this one as a simple example the instant the idea of being able to speak was categorized as a privilege all of a sudden huge swaths of people are going well no you don't actually have a right to free speech we don't need that If someone doesn't want to publish, they don't have to. So again, this isn't something we're seeing expanded. This is something that seems to be very deliberately and consciously being restricted, which, as I've already have said, is the normal course when you have things called a privilege. The instant something is called a privilege, the elite try to take it away. In this case, your ability to publish a document you have written on a speech platform of your choosing. But do you have a right to publish? Yes, you do. It's constitutional. Now, a right to publish is not explicitly in a state of nature. Again, there is a right to form an oral tradition. You have a right in a state of nature to speak and to recite a concept, story, or fable you have come up with. This extends to written language once such a thing exists. So, yes, we can assert a right on an internet platform at the very least to publish. Is there a titleage to publish? I'm really not seeing how there would be. You might say there is an obligation to be forward and honest with ideas you have had. That potentially has merit. I'm curious how we would facilitate that again. But no, I'm really not seeing a titleage to publish. There is no, at least not in present society, obligation, positive or negative, to publish a document. Now, SJWs might argue there is an obligation not to publish if individuals find the statement you have made offensive, but then we get into the problem that literally all speech is offensive to someone. So it is only on non-reciprocal grounds that such an obligation can be imposed. So, again, this isn't a privilege, it's a right. And being denied a right does not denote others having a privilege. 
I'm going to have to read this next one aloud because it is very, very long. Number nine, I can go into a music shop and count on finding the music of my race represented, into a supermarket and find staple foods which fit with my cultural traditions, into a hairdresser's shop and find someone who can cut my hair. I'm currently sitting in a truck stop in which the only food available is fried chicken. So I'm going to go with no, this isn't universal to white people. It's actually very common for me to end up in a parking lot with either no food available or no food that even remotely represents anything anyone in Germany or Ireland would ever have eaten. Like fried chicken is huge in truck stops, mostly because it's easy to make and relatively simple to preserve. <coughs> Let's say, do most record shops carry music from a diversity of cultures? Well, sorry, totally off topic. Blah, what am I thinking? Is it reasonable that no one should walk into a record store, a supermarket, or a hairdresser and find anyone able to do anything with the culture they represent? No. Again, this gets us back to the issue of majority versus minority populations. If 90% of the people walking into your supermarket eat kimchi, and only 10% of the people walking into your supermarket eat hamburgers, your kimchi aisle is going to be freaking huge and you may very well stop carrying hamburgers after a couple of weeks. I have friends who went to Japan and China and told me flat out it is almost impossible to find American cuisine in those areas because nobody buys it. Conversely, you're probably going to have a pretty rough time finding sushi in Jakarta, finding kimchi in Russia, or, I don't know, fried chicken might be in South America. I've never really been there. But yeah, yeah like culturally specific foods aren't going to migrate very far outside of the regions where the culture is predominant. So, next thing, do you have a right to either have music, food, or hairstyling appropriate to your culture? No, culture does not exist in a state of nature. This is not even remotely observable anywhere. Markets are not natural. People don't tend to get this, and I don't understand why. Markets are a direct and immediate product of the government, one, enforcing property, and two, enforcing contract. So the existence of a store at all cannot be a right, because in a condition of a state of nature, stores would not exist. Is there a reciprocal obligation? Not seeing it. Really not seeing it. I, I You might have a positive obligation, but what obligation could be imposed? Like my obligation to have my hair styled? My obligation to listen to music? My obligation to eat kimchi? Do I have an obligation to eat sushi, kimchi, fried chicken? I don't think I have a positive obligation there. Do I have a negative obligation not to do them? Not really. So again, th this is nothing. There's nothing here. It's not a titleage. It's not a privilege. It's not a right. It's simply by dint of the fact 
that the majority of people in our nation are not members of these other cultures. Therefore, stores which have limited shelf space aren't going to carry items which the majority of people walking in the door aren't going to purchase. Okay? And again, the only way you're going to be able to change that is to force people who have no interest in this culture to consume the culture. Like, I'm not going to tell people they have to watch anime if they don't want to. I'm not going to tell people they have to eat sushi if they don't want to, or eat kimchi if they don't want to, or eat fried chicken if they don't want to. I like sushi. I've actually debated making sushi myself for quite some time. I think I'd have an incredibly good luck with a... Uh, it's a particular type of fish. I can't remember the name of it now. It's orange, not salmon. Uh, tilapia, that's it. I actually think I might have really, really good luck with lemon rice and tilapia sushi. Haven't had time to try it yet, but I get, I'm digressing. I'm getting off topic. There is not a right to have every culture represented in every venue. And you might argue there is a positive obligation that could be imposed. You might say venues are required to have a broad diversity of cultures, but then you're going to have to pay for that. Like you're going to have to deliberately fund grocery stores to keep sushi on the shelves, which unquestionably they're going to have to throw away every couple of weeks. And that gets into us into a whole issue. That's a whole slew of environmental concerns right there. I mean, we already are having a colossal problem with food waste in this country. And you want to exacerbate it by forcing grocery stores to carry products they know they're not going to sell? Oh, boy. Like, th this is petty bourgeoisie garbage on rabid display right here. Alrighty, we are at something like 45 minutes to an hour, so I'm going to call this to a halt. This has generally been completely incoherent, particularly the last five, where you're just sobbing and whining about the effects of having what is normally observer, observable in any culturally dominant area. You're not going to have schnitzel in the Congo or in Brazil. You're not going to have fish and chips in the Philippines or sauerkraut or, I don't know, Italian sausage, like actual Italian sausage, not the fake stuff. Um, do they have vodka in Brazil? Yeah, probably. I'm willing to bet it's not actual Russian vodka, though. Like, culturally specific foods, culturally specific customs aren't going to be present in areas where those cultures are not predominant. That's simply basic conservation of resources. And that's another thing I've noticed about this list. All of this functionally assumes the very, very petty bourgeoisie idea that we have an infinite supply of resources to do this with. And that is one of the things that really appalls me about a lot of what the SJWs are doing is the just blanket assumption that climate change isn't a thing isn't really happening. We don't need to pay attention to this. We don't need to conserve anything at all. We can just throw a mountain of resources at everything we please, and it's not going to impact the environment. Yes, yes it is. If we double, triple, quadruple the amount of food we are throwing in the garbage, that is going to have huge environmental consequences. Okay? Huge environmental consequences. And that's not even covered anywhere in this. 
so much of this checklist has been a very blatant, well, I'm aware of the fact that I'm not the majority in this culture, but I want everything in this culture to cater to my interests. That's wonderful. I want everything in this culture to cater to my interests too. Guess what? Not everyone is a gamer. Not everyone likes Dungeons and Dragons. So no, walking into a random bookshop, I'm not going to find first and second edition D&D books on the shelves because most people aren't interested in that. So, where does this leave us? I am going to pick up this video again with number 10. I know I promised you 13 of them, but again, this is massively long, much longer than I thought it was going to be. So we will do 10 through 19. Then I think the video after that, we're going to start getting into the ones that Ms. McIntosh did not come up with. There's like 50 of these somewhere. And with that, I bid all of you a good evening and wish you the best of weeks.